You're aware, of course, of his uh, children's books, The Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, he also has some fiction works called the um, Space Trilogy, I'm sure some of you might be familiar with. But there's another fiction writing that um, some of you may or may not have read, and it's called The Screwtape Letters. And The Screwtape Letters is an interesting book. It's, it's, it's C.S. Lewis's effort to give a glimpse into the demonic realm and uh, how that operates. And the way that the book is set up, it has a, 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 a demon by the name of Screwtape who would be considered a senior demon, and then a junior uh, demon called um, Wormwood. And the idea is that Screwtape is his mentor. And so the book is structured around a series of letters in which uh, Screwtape gives him instruction, admonition, warnings uh, on how to um, supervise his patient. His patient is someone that he's responsible uh, to keep away from Christ. And you'll hear him refer to the enemy in his letters to Wormwood. The enemy is Jesus Christ. So I want to start off our sermon this morning with, uh, this is right at the beginning of the Screwtape letters. And I want you to hear the admonition that Screwtape gives to Wormwood. He says, he says, remember, your patient is not like you, a pure spirit. Never having been a human, and he has a little parenthetical co comment here that's really interesting because he's referring to Jesus. And he says, oh, that abominable advantage of the enemies. Screwtape, the demon, recognizes that Jesus has an advantage over any other demon because Jesus is fully human. Jesus understands our temptations and trials like no pure spirit is able to. And Screwtape says to Wormwood, you don't realize how enslaved they are to the pressures of the ordinary life. Jesus does. Jesus is fully human. He understands our temptations and our trials. This, of course, is a touching point with uh, John's epistle um, uh, in 1 John because that's part of the problem. The false teachers do not have the right concept of who Jesus Christ is. They don't believe that he can be fully human. So here we have a demon. I understand this fiction, but I also know that the demonic world understands the reality of this. Jesus is fully human, and so there's a sense in which they've got an advantage over these false teachers. Our text this morning tells us to test the spirits. And so as I read through this section, I came up with three questions. One is, what is John talking about when he says spirits? What are the spirits? So that's question number one that I want to answer. The second thing is, he, said, he, he tells us to test the spirits. So my second question is, well, how do we test the spirits? So we need to answer those two questions. And then the third, when he talks about this world in which we live um, that's under the influence of the enemy, and so my question is, how do we live successfully in a world that's full of false prophets? So those are the three questions I want to answer this morning. What are the spirits? How do we test the spirits? And how do we live successfully in a world full of false prophets? Let's start off with the first one. And in order to do this, I want to go back to the larger, larger context of what John is saying to us. Let's go back to the Gospel of John. I want to cite a number of references that you'll be familiar with. Remember at the baptism of Jesus, uh, the Spirit descends on him in the form of a dove. And John the Baptist makes the comment that this same Jesus is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. Remember later on in chapter 7 at the Feast of Booth, Jesus says, Whoever believes in me, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And Jesus, of course, was referring to the Holy Spirit and the work that he would do in the future of believers. So you see already very early in, in, in the Gospel of John uh, that, that there's, a, there's a presentation of the Holy Spirit who is critical on the life of Jesus, but also is going to play a very dynamic role in the lives of all followers of Jesus. He goes on. In chapter 7 of the Gospel of John at the Feast of Booth, G, uh, John writes, who, Jesus says, whoever believes in me, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, we know what he's talking about there. The Holy Spirit is the one who's going to enable believers to trust in Jesus and have faith in him. The Holy Spirit's the one that's going to regenerate our hearts and enable us to, to know uh, that the truth about Jesus is true and to follow him. 
Remember at the, the, with the uh, Samaritan woman at the well where he sits down with her and he says, he says to her, all worshipers, true worshipers will worship, worship the Father in spirit and in truth. That is such a rich statement. Let's put it in his context a little bit. The Samaritan woman, of course, comes from a tradition of those who descended from the northern tribe, the Israelites who were separated from the southern tribe where the temple was built. And if you know anything about what the Bible teaches, the tabernacle, the temple, those were the places of God's special presence. God dwelt with his people in a, in a place of special presence, and it was in those locations. The northern tribe, when they, the monarchy separated, they didn't have the temple. The temple was in Jerusalem. So at the time Christ comes, it becomes an issue. Where is the right place to worship God? And Jesus is saying, that's the wrong question at this stage. And we know that Jesus himself, remember when he goes to the temple and he drives out the money changers and he says, tear down this temple and in three days I will rebuild it. What was he talking about? Jesus was talking about himself as the temple of God. John says this very clearly in the opening chapters of his gospel. The word was God. The word was with God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt is tabernacle. It has reference pointing to the temple. And so when Jesus comes, Jesus is the temple. He's replaced the building. Jesus himself is the temple. But we also know that when Jesus is alluding to the tell, tell the Samaritan woman that we're going to worship God in spirit and truth, he's pointing even beyond himself. When Jesus dies and is resurrected and ascends into heaven, who becomes the temple of God? Paul teaches us very clearly, you and I, those who have faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit who regenerates our hearts, he takes up residence in us, and God is now present in us as humans, and we are the temple of God. Jesus goes on in the Gospels, and he warns us, he tells his disciples, I'm going to leave you, but when I leave you, I'm going to give you the paraclete. The paraclete, the Greek word that's translated comforter, um, advocate, counselor, this is the Holy Spirit, and Jesus is saying, he will, the paraclete will be with you forever, the spirit of truth who the world cannot receive. So there's something about the one who regenerates our heart, the one who is present in us, is the same one uh, that is going to speak the truth to us and through us and in us, but is different from the world. The message that's going to come from the Holy Spirit is not the same message you're going to get from the world. And Jesus says to his disciples, when the spirit of truth comes, he will bear witness about me. And of course, we know that's exactly what Jesus has done through his disciples and continues through us today. So that's the gospel of John. That's a rich background, just running through it very quickly, reminding ourselves that John has a lot to say about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is very prominent, very center stage in the teaching of the apostle John. In 1 John, we pick up, and just real quickly, I'll run through some of these. Remember in chapter 2, when Byron preached on this, you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. Jesus told his disciples, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has come, and he's the one who enables us to know the truth. Also in chapter 2, since they have the Holy Spirit, they don't need anyone to teach them. That's a pretty strong statement, and it harks back to John, the Gospel of John in chapter 14. Remember when Jesus was preaching to his disciples? He's, he's getting ready to leave them, and he says, But the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I told you. That's what the Holy Spirit has done for the, for the apostles. Remember John says at the beginning of his epistle, what we have heard, what we have seen, what we have touched. The Holy Spirit is going to bring all that to mind for the apostles. And as they teach, they're teaching what Christ wanted them to say because the Holy Spirit is bringing it to their mind. In 1 John chapter 3, remember Byron preached on this, everyone who is born of God does not sin because his seed remains in him. Not only does the Holy Spirit regenerate our hearts and bring us to Christ, but he enables us to live faithfully for Christ. So that as we were as we were taught in that section, we no longer 
are committed to the practice of sin, but we're committed to the practice of holiness and righteousness. And the last thing I want to draw to our attention is in chapter four. This will actually be read next week. But John writes, this is how we know we remain in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. Very critical to understand this section this morning is who is foremost in, in the background here. And without a shadow of a doubt, the Holy Spirit is front and center. What else does John talk about? Remember, he mentions this, this idea of the spirit of Antichrist. So let's go back to John real quickly. We'll spend less time here. Remember when John, when uh, Jesus was speaking to the Jews in chapter 8, and he says, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. We've heard him echo that in his epistle of 1 John. At the Last Supper, remember when Judas takes the bread from Jesus, and he takes the bread, and, and, and John writes that Satan had entered him. And then in chapter 14, just prior to his crucifixion, Jesus says to his disciples, I will not talk with you much longer because the ruler of this world is coming. John talks about the ruler of this world in the epistle of First John. It all connects. The spirit of Antichrist, the one that's behind the influence of the world, is, is recognized to be Satan himself. In First John, he picks up with these themes and he elaborates on them. First John chapter 3, remember he says, The one who commits sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The significance of Satan continues in the, in the epistle we've been reading. And anyone who is committed to the practice of sin is not born of God. They're still a, a child of the enemy, of Satan himself. Remember Jesus, remember that John writes to the young man and he says, you have conquered the evil one. And then finally, in chapter two, and even in our section to the day, today, uh, John alludes to the fact that Antichrist is coming and many Antichrists have come. So we've got two figures here before we unpack this, this text before us, we need to be aware of their presence. More attention is given to the Holy Spirit, and rightly so. But the reality of Satan is there as well, and we have to be aware of that. When I was thinking about the imperative that he gives us to test the spirits, it, it brought to my mind um, an, an experience years ago when I was a principal at a Christian school one of my students told me of, of an experience of his dad, uh, and I knew his dad to be a fine Christian man. He was a good, he was a good man. He was driving through Casadega one day, and he had, he had an interesting experience. Now, if any of you know anything about Casadega, I live over here in Deland. Casadega is a little place over here uh, that's known as a home to uh, psychics, uh, spiritualists, mediums, uh, to be honest with you, I've never spent any time over there, so I don't know. I don't know the reality of it. But my student's dad was driving through there one day, and he he just had this this strange sense about him. He felt that there was something present that was um, almost oppressive. And he says he looked in his rearview mirror, and he had this picture of this this image of this wolf in the background with these red glowing eyes. Now, I don't know whether his dad had too much pizza for lunch. I don't know whether he was having a psychotic break. I don't know whether he really had some sort of spiritual experience. I really don't know the answer to that. But my question is, is that the sort of thing that John's talking about when he tells us to test the spirits? Are we supposed to go around looking for some sort of demonic image or presence or something of that nature? And I can quickly tell you, I don't think that's what he's talking about. I think his message to us is, and this leads us into step two, the spirit and how we test them go hand in hand. What he's talking about is the false messages that come from false prophets in the world, false teachers in the world. Listen to what he says here. He says, this is how you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. There's your test. Is the message that these false teachers are giving you, is it consistent with what, the, what John and what the apostles have taught you from the beginning? If it's not consistent, it's wrong. You need to discard it. 
John has made it crystal clear that Jesus is fully God and fully human. The false teachers are saying he's not. Therefore, by, te by that test itself, you know that these, this is not coming from the Holy Spirit. This is coming from the enemy. So when our first test is, is it, does it match with the teaching of the apostles? And I would say for us, we have a great privilege because at that time, the apostles did not have the whole Bible in their hands like we do. And so we'll talk about this more in a moment, but one of the ways we're going to test the spirits, we're going to test the messages that come to us, is it consistent with what Scripture teaches? It's a real simple question. There's another aspect of it, though, that's, that's maybe not as clear in this section, but it isn't clear in, the, in the, um, the book of 1 John as a whole. There's another test. Not only does their message matter, but also their behavior and their conduct matters. These false teachers are not living out the message of the gospel. They're not living out the message of the gospel. As, as Byron has preached to us before, there's a sense in which they, they really are not torn apart by the presence of sin and struggling with sin in their lives. They don't care about it. And that itself is a red flag. Anybody who says that sin, that struggling with sin is not an issue uh, is not from God. But the other thing the other thing is this, and this reminds me when I was first choosing to go to seminary back when I was in college, I picked a seminary that I thought was most in line and, and the best uh, representative of the theological tradition I was pursuing. Before I went to seminary, I, I came, I did a good amount of reading, but I came under the influence of a subculture of this theological tradition. And I was enamored by them. They knew the Bible well. Um, they, they, gave me insights that I had never seen before. And I thought, you know what, I want, I want to follow this more. So when I got to seminary, I met some of them and things began to change a little bit. True enough, they were very intelligent. They had a good grasp of scripture. Um, but what I began to see more and more is these were hard people. They were judgmental people. They were calloused. These are not the sort of people, if you're struggling in your Christian faith or you're uh, maybe in your marriage or raising your children or something of that nature, these are not the people you're going to go to and say, hey, I'm really struggling. I need some help. The, the, the sense of compassion was lacking there. The lack of love was not there. And I got to the point where I said to myself, even if they're right, I don't want to be like these people. And so I pulled away. Later on, I became convinced that, that their emphasis on teaching was not quite uh, accurate as well. The same thing happens here. Um, what is very fascinating to me is the scripture passage that we have this morning is sandwiched into two sections. Byron preached last week and he'll preach again next week. And the central part of that is love. So everything we have to say today has got to be read within the context, the larger context of what came last week and what came last week. So there's two ways we can test the spirit. One is their message consistent with scripture. But secondly, the messengers themselves, is their lifestyle consistent with the, with the gospel, with the presence? Uh, can we look at those people and say the Holy Spirit lives in them? I can see evidence of that. So that answers the first two questions. We know what the spirits are. We have a general idea of how to test the spirits. John goes on in this section to talk about, and, and in the rest of the epistle, to talk about uh, the presence of, of influences in the world. And so my last question to answer is this. How do we live successfully in this world full of false prophets? We're bombarded with messages from all sorts of avenues every day. How do we distinguish what is from God and what's not from God? There's lots of answers to that question. I'm going to focus on three. <clears throat> the first one, which I think will come very naturally from what has been said so far this morning. Number one is know that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is something I think we don't think about enough, but Jesus has given us the Holy Spirit. We know that the new temple was Jesus and now is the people of God, according to what the Apostle Paul has taught us. If we're the temple of God, we've got the Holy Spirit within us. That's huge. That's an amazing thing because remember, 
what John says in this section here this morning, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The reality is we have demonic influences all around us, but we're, Christianity is not dualistic. We don't have one God who's good and one God who's bad, and they just fight it out, and sometimes one wins and sometimes the other wins. Satan is no match for the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit indwells each of us. Think about it for a moment. Our goal at Identity Church is to reflect diversity that honors the unity that we have in Christ. And that, you know, our objective is, and look at this morning, I'd love to see the fact that we have racial and ethnic diversity. Um, we may have the greater percentage of that than any other church this morning. I don't really know. But here's the critical issue. What's more important than the, than the racial and ethnic diversity is what the Holy Spirit does for us. He's given us all spiritual gifts, and he brings us together in one place so that we can pull those spiritual gifts together to bring glory to his name, to edify one another, and to radiate the goodness and glory of God into the community in which we live. So not only do we have the Holy Spirit, but we have the Holy Spirit who develops these spiritual gifts within us. That is profound. And not only does he produce these spiritual gifts within us, remember what Paul writes in Galatians? The Holy Spirit is the one that, that develops these character qualities in us known as the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. And then finally, there's so much more that can be said about the Holy Spirit, but we know from what Jesus has said and what John has elaborated in his epistles, the Holy Spirit is the one who illuminates the scriptures before us so that when we read God's word, listen, I understand God's word can get very complicated at times, but the essentials of the faith, the things that are necessary for us to know to walk successfully in the Christian life, they can be grasped, and the Holy Spirit's the one that enables us to grasp them and recall them to our thoughts and to live them out. So here are the first two steps. How do we live successfully uh, in a world full of false prophets? Number one, know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And remember, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Step two, know your Bible. Read it. Meditate on it. View the world through it. I'm going to kind of focus on meditation in a moment because I have an illustration in the third step that, that, bring, that highlights that. But one of the things I, I want to draw to your attention, when we're going through a book of the Bible, the person who meditates the most on whatever book we're in is going to be Byron. And I promise you that Byron right now is living through the lens of 1 John. He's constantly studying it. He's consulting commentary. He's, praying, he's trying to say, God, how can I deliver this to, uh, to the people of identity so it accurately reflects what you want us to know and enables them to live faithfully to you? And to that end, he's got the entire book of 1 John that's constantly just going around his mind. And I have a challenge for us, and this is, trust me, it's a challenge for me as much as it is for you. If we are really going to take the Bible seriously, and if we're going to come together as a fellowship, then one of the things we need to do is to take more seriously the preaching of God's word. And understand what I'm saying by that. I know that when we all come together on Sunday mornings, we all listen very carefully to what Byron preaches us. We listen very carefully to the word. I know that everybody who's listening right now, your desire is to understand God's word and to follow, follow God faithfully. But my question is, and I'm asking me, I'm asking this question to me even more so than you guys. Do I just wait until Sunday morning to visit that section of scripture? Or do I stay with it all week? And do I just focus on that one section of scripture? Or do I go back and read 1 John from the beginning and to the end so that when we're in a book of study together, am I allowing the whole book to impact me? The more you read through the book of First John over and over, you're going to see connections that you won't see if you just drop in Sunday morning, give it your full attention, but then drop out of sight for the rest of the week. Before the service started this morning, I read through the whole book of First John again. It's just amazing. 
it's just it is simply amazing and and there's so much richness in here so part of what i'm challenging us to do is as a as a fellowship of believers when we go through a study like this together don't just focus on that little section trust me when you see the section we're reading today and you go back and read what Byron preached last week and then you listen to what he's going to preach next week it's going to make so much more meaning to you and have such a stronger impact Step one, know that the whole, that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Know your Bible, read it, study it, meditate on it. And I'm challenging us as we go through a study of the Word of God together, read the whole, the whole uh, uh, book of that section and read over and over and over. By the way, when I used to be a teacher, we would, whether it was a history or an English lesson or whatever, um, I knew that my students would quite often just read a paragraph and then try to answer the question, and they didn't understand the paragraph. And I would say that to them over and over again, you know what? It's okay for you to read that paragraph more than one time. You're probably not going to get it when you just read it the first time. Read it several times. Some of you might need to read it six or seven times. It's okay to do that. And I would say the same thing for us uh, as far as God's word goes. The third step is this. John has made it crystal clear that the world in which we live has a ruler that will seek to pull us away from the faith. And that's what John's concern is. These false teachers would pull God's people away from the faith and turn their back on Christianity. And so one of the thoughts that came to me is how do we alert ourselves to the culture in which we live and the false messages that come from our culture? And I remembered a book that I bought a few years ago. It's by an author named Mary Poplin, and it's called Is Reality Secular? And here's what she does in that book. She says, she acknowledges everybody has a worldview. And we know what a worldview is. A worldview is just your system of thinking, your way that you make sense out of the world in which you live. And parts of our worldview, we don't even, we're not even aware of them because we've just gathered them from the culture that we've grown up in. And so whatever culture has been our predominant influence, we've absorbed senses of how we interpret the reality around us from that culture. And then all of us have subcultures within that. What Mary Poplin did is she says, I know there, there are just numerous worldviews out there, but she argues I'm going to boil them down into four categories. Now, the fourth category is where the Christian faith lies in. I'm going to lop that off for this morning. Um, because we have a pretty good grip on what Christianity teaches. But the other three is what I want to bring to your attention. And the other three stand in direct opposition to the truth of Christianity. The first one she refers to as material naturalism. Well, that sounds like some big words. What's she talking about? It's real simple. Material naturalism is the belief that the natural, the physical, the material world is all that there is. And if that's all that there is, there can be no God. There can be no spiritual. With all the miracles that you all were talking about that, that came from a spiritual reality, that's not possible. Things can only be explained by, by the world in which we see, hear, taste, touch, that sort of thing. What has come out of that system of belief is something called scientism. And scientism is the belief that any... That, that science itself is the sole arbiter of truth. If you're going to know anything, it has to be validated by science. And if it can't be validated by science, then you really can't believe it. Can you put the Holy Spirit under a microscope or see him in a telescope? Now, let me quickly say something here. Let me quickly say something here. Christianity is not at odds with science. Hear me say that loud and clear. Christianity is not at odds with science. I remember when I was the first year I was in seminary, I was reading through a systematic theology from a 20th century theologian, early 20th century theologian. And he made this comment. He said, science will not contradict the Bible. The Bible will not contradict science. And if they do, we've either misunderstood one or the other or both. I think that's true. I think that what he said is absolutely accurate. Look at our fellowship that we have right here. How many people do we have that work in the medical community? 
And the providence of God, I think that's a very interesting factor. For some reason, God is, with, with our small fellowship that we have at the moment, God has chosen to bring people in the medical community whose very practice every single day depends on science. And thank God for that. It's a gift from God. We have folks right here within our fellowship that go every day in the name of God to minister using the technology and the discoveries of science to help people get better. That is just a wonderful vocation. Christianity is not at odds with that. Christianity supports and validates that. I think of Embry-Riddle down the road from, uh, from, from where um, we will worship together one day. <laughs> um, Embry-Riddle is based on the sciences. That school there, the majors are based on that. We have people that have fellowshiped with us from Embry-Riddle and, would, and by God's grace will do so again. We need to have a church that validates these callings and appreciates and recognizes them as a gift of God, which they are. And we need to allow them the freedom to be in these vocations with complete confidence that Jesus is in the middle of this, which he is. And so my message to you is this morning, Christianity has no disagreement with science. They both are reflections of God. What Christianity differs with is scientism. Scientism is not the same as science. Scientism says that science is the sole arbiter of truth and it's the only way you can know reality. And that statement itself is not scientific. It, step out, it steps outside of the bounds of science. Enough of that, but be aware. Material naturalism is one of those things that if you get into the midst of it, it's going to pull you away from the faith. The second one that she brings is secular humanism. Well, secular humanism, this is simple. Actually, she uses an illustration. It's a cartoon, and this is the best way to get a vision of what secular humanism is. It's a cartoon of, of Jean-Paul Sartre, who was a 20th century philosopher. And picture this. He's chiseling himself out of stone. Just picture this figure, and he's got his hand on the hammer and the chisel on the other, and he's sculpting himself. And that is a picture of secular humanism. Man makes himself. Human reason is the supreme reality. All that is necessary can be accomplished through the mind. Humans have become very impressed with themselves. They don't need this superstition in God anymore. All they need is their human reason to figure things out. Look around you in the world today and ask the question, how has that helped us up to this point? So Christianity obviously cannot be in agreement with humans putting themselves at the center of things. Now, be aware of this. Those first two categories, material naturalism and secular humanism, they're taught across the country in our public school systems and in our universities. And let me say very quickly, I know Christians who are in all of those areas. But if we're going to be honest with ourselves, the messages that, that come from these two categories, they've infiltrated our educational systems, they've, infi they've infiltrated the political systems, they've infiltrated the media, the movies, the stories that we read and watch through uh, film and television, they are everywhere. And I'm not telling you to separate and just be absent from those, from those places. What I'm saying is we need to be aware of them and we need not to be led astray by them. The third category is in contradiction to the first two categories. And remember what Mary Poplin is saying, these are the three categories apart from Christianity through the influences of the world come to us. The third category is called pantheism slash spiritualism. And this is a teaching that there's only one substance, one spirit from which everything else emerges and exists. Pantheism does recognize a spiritual reality, in fact, it, it's this is an overly simplistic explanation of it, but like there's there's one essence that's always existed and everything you see has come out of that essence. And you as an individual, one day you're going to be you're going to go back into that essence. It's kind of like a melting pot and you're just going to be subsumed in there. Your individuality won't exist anymore. 
your, your, your destiny is to be subsumed into this universal consciousness. This has had a huge impact in our world. Westerners have taken this from, from Eastern teachings and they've made it very popular uh, in our country. People in Hollywood uh, focus on it all the time. There's one person, and we're getting to the end of our message this morning, but there's one person who came to mind on this because I came across two young people, two young adults who were raised in evangelical churches, and they they were reading uh, this, this book by a man by the name of Eckhart Tolle. Eckhart Tolle is a spiritualist. If you read anything by him, he's a pantheist. And I want you to hear part of what he says. Oprah's given him lots of exposures, and there are young Christians in our world that are being drawn to him. And one of the reasons they're drawn to him and others of Eastern religions is because of some of the disciplines such as meditation. Here's what Eckhart Tolle teaches. Remember when Jesus talked about the abundant life? Eckhart Tolle says, he, he instead of using the term abundant life, he uses the term fullness of life. And he says what Jesus was referring to was a state of consciousness. Now, you all can go look that up when Jesus talks to the abundant life. See if that's really what he's talking about. I think you were all starting to shake your head. No, nah, that's not exactly what he meant. But this is what Toll says. You need to realize that in the essence of who you are, you are already totally complete. Your essence came from this universal essence. You're already complete. You're already a microcosm of the entire universe. The entire history of the universe is contained in you. And so here's what you need to do. You need to meditate. You need to block out any thoughts about the past, any anxiety over the future. You need to exist just in the present. Forget about everything else. Allow yourself only to exist in the presence. This is what he calls pure consciousness. I'm really struck by the fact that more and more over the years I've heard People are drawn to Buddhism, pantheism, and others because of this one discipline of meditation. I get it. The world is an anxious place. Just turn on the news today. Afghanistan, Haiti, all the other things that are thrown in our face every day, the struggles you have, on and on and on and on. If we go around the room, and we've done this before, we all have reasons to be anxious. What Tull is saying, some of that's just an illusion and you need to just block it from your mind and you need to connect to the universe of consciousness that you came from. And you just need to experience the absence of all of that. Now, what I struggle with is this. When you look, look at the word meditation in the Bible and you will find all sorts of scriptural allusions to meditation. But I don't hear God saying, just empty your brain and everything's going to be OK. I hear him say, fill your brain with thoughts of me. We need to focus on God. We need to focus on Jesus Christ. We don't need to just empty our minds and allow other evil spirits to fill them. We need to allow the Holy Spirit and his fullness to develop the spiritual gifts and the fruit of the spirit within us in the midst of all these things that create anxiety. And so John has a very great message, very great message. Test the spirits. Brothers and sisters, we need to test the spirits. Is the message consistent with what Scripture says? If not, we need to reject it. But know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God himself resides in you. He's given you his word. Read it. Meditate on it. Dwell on it. And then together, let us be aware of the influences that come to us uh, from, from the world and let us navigate those together. Let us not be led astray. Let us not allow those to be handled incorrectly to make ourselves an enemy of science or an enemy of intelligence because God doesn't want that either. But let us run everything through the grid of Scripture. I started with C.S. Lewis. I want to finish with a quote from C.S. Lewis. So let's return to the screw tape letters. Screw tape says to Wormwood, he says, one of our greatest allies at present is the church itself. Well, that got my attention. 
One of the greatest allies of the demonic world is the church itself. When your patient gets to his pew and he looks around, he sees just that selection of neighbors who he has up to this point avoided. You want to lean pretty heavily on those neighbors. Provided that any of those neighbors sing out of tune, have boots that squeak, or double chins or odd clothes, the patient will easily believe that their religion must therefore be somehow ridiculous. That takes us into a whole other discussion. Christians allow themselves to be divided over the most petty and ridiculous uh, situations, and we must not allow ourselves to do that. But that goes beyond the text this morning. Byron's going to pick that up again next week to complement what he preached to us about last week. And so I invite you to come back because the message continues. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father God, we know that we are in the presence of the Holy One. God, you have given us so many gifts. You have given us the Lord Jesus Christ himself who has accomplished our salvation. And as the book of Revelation teaches, we know that we are overcomers in him. And we know that the new heavens and the new earth will one day uh, come together and we will be in your presence in pure glory and pure worship. And for now, you're asking us to, to live and, uh, and follow your will as it is done in heaven. And we know, God, to this end that you have equipped us with your Holy Spirit. And we ask at identity that he will develop these spiritual gifts in this body that he will develop the fruit of the spirit, that you will enable us as we continue to go through the word of God together to understand it and to put it into practice, and that we will be people known as those who love one another. Prepare us, our God, for the sermon next week. Put it on our hearts and minds. Bring back to our memory all the things that we've learned in First John. Help us to go back and read through it again and to tie it all together because we know that the Holy Spirit does that within us. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.